To the average person, a hardware store might be the place for tools and repair supplies, but to a chemist, it's practically a treasure trove of hidden chemical possibilities. We see it as a cheap place to get some very useful chemicals for our reactions. Shockingly enough, some of the chemicals sold off the shelf fall under the regulation of the Drug Enforcement Administration, due to them being used in the production of illicit substances. The DEA chemical list has stuff as mundane as acetone to exotic like lithium aluminum hydride. This list is quite annoying for any law-abiding or amateur home chemist. In a previous video, we showed how we could extract one of these chemicals on the list by distilling crude oil into tylene, commonly sold as paint thinner. Today, we're using hardware store chemicals starting with tylene, performing radical chlorination with chlorine gas generated by pool cleaner to make benzoyl chloride, then hopefully produce some benzaldehyde, which are two more DEA-regulated chemicals. I should note that the manufacture of illegal drugs is considered bad, and has harsh punishments when you finally get caught. For a radical synthesis, we need three things. The first is what's going to be made into radical form. In this case, we want to make benzoyl chloride, so we'll be using chlorine gas. Next, we need to make the chlorine gas into radical form, which means we need energy source to break the bonds of chlorine. We will use UV light. This can come from a few places, like the sun or UV bulbs. The last thing and final thing we need is material in which the chlorine will react with, in this case, tylene. Before we can do that, it's important to note that benzoyl chloride was once used for chemical warfare. With that being said, it's not pleasant to work with, unless you're in a properly ventilated area, and will cause irritation even in small quantities. Also, chlorine gas is not the most pleasant thing to breathe as well. Its toxic effects will kill you by destroying your ability to breathe, which is not a pleasant way to go. I ended up having to attempt this reaction three times to finally get a successful run with a setup that worked well. In my first attempt, I used a three-neck flask within a photochemical reactor. The photochemical reactor produces a UV light which supplies the energy to create the radicals of chlorine. The problem occurs here is that I don't have quartz glass flasks. I only have borosilicate. The interesting thing about glass is it absorbs light in different ways. Quartz glass is nearly transparent to UV light meaning most of the UV light just goes right through it. But on the other hand, borosilicate glass blocks most of the light, only letting a small fraction in. This means that our reaction time will increase, which is fine. I would just have to let the reaction run for longer. The reaction ended up working and producing our benzoyl chloride. This was confirmed via sample taken and analysis done on it. Though in my first run, the bubbler that was passing chlorine gas into the system created a vacuum upon gas not being produced anymore. This led to it being sucked back into the wash bottle, destroying it when it reacted with sulfuric acid. For the second run, I used the same reactor setup, but this time I added another wash bottle that would be empty, so in case of backflow, it would just get sucked into there and not any further, keeping the product safe. This time, a different problem occurred. When the gas generation stopped, it still created a vacuum, but it wasn't able to make its way back into the wash bottle, and ended up reacting with the rubber tube that I was passing the gas through. The benzoyl chloride reacted with all of it, destroying the benzoyl chloride in the process. Well then. Okay, so third time's the charm, hopefully. I decided to ditch the whole reactor setup that I had initially. It wasn't working very effectively, so let's bring the light inside the reaction vessel. To do this, I switched to a different photochemical reactor. The reason why I didn't want to use this one initially was for a few reasons. One is I like to show chemistry that can be repeated. And the first setup is the simplest that you could do a reflux outside and get the same process done, which can still be done, but it will take longer using sunlight. Another was to avoid having to figure out how to power the thing, and I have to make some fittings for it. This is an older reaction vessel, and the power supply has been lost to time, so I'll have to jerry-rig something. I was able to get a discharge tube transformer and jump it with two alligator clips to the bulb and get it running. The next problem that occurred was that this uses O-ring joints, these flat joints are different from the ground glass joints that we are accustomed to. Instead, as the name implies, they use o-rings and clips to keep them sealed. I don't have very many pieces of o-ring glassware. I do have a glass blowing torch though, so I'll have to make some joints. I need three in particular. One to connect a reflux condenser to, one to connect a thermometer to, and one as a gas inlet. Good thing I'm a hoarder and I was able to keep some cutoffs from my broken piece of equipment. I'll use those. Let's start off with the condenser connection. Unfortunately, I can't seem to find the footage of making the glassware initially, so I refilmed the process with different glass. For the condenser, I need to create a ground glass joint on one side and an o-ring on the other. Connecting them creates an adapter. I began by heating the open end of each part.
I have a blow hose attached to the ground glass joint section with a cork stopper in the o-ring part. This will allow me to apply pressure from the inside when I connect them. Next, I slowly rotate them in the flame to heat them up evenly to working temp. Once hot enough, I push them together and squish the glass flush, fusing it. I then slightly pull apart the parts and blow some air from the inside. With a bit more heating, the tube even outs. Next, I gently heat the part, which will anneal it. It makes it less fragile by removing stress in the glass. After, I pop it in the oven and allow it to cool down slowly. The glass we use is called borosilicate, which is useful in glassware because it's a great ability to handle rapid temperature changes without cracking or breaking. Next, we make the thermometer adapter, which is the easiest to make of all. All I need to do is heat up the end of an o-ring joint section and flare it out so a thermometer adapter sleeve seals on it properly. After flaring it out, I throw it into the oven to cool down slowly. The last part we need is a gas adapter, and I'll be using an o-ring section and a gas dispersion tube. The section I have for this o-ring size is quite small, so that might be problematic. Next, I heat up the o-ring section and remove material until a hole forms. Then I flare out the hole till a dispersion tube fits into it. Next, I insert the tube and apply air pressure from the inside of the gas tube to bulge it out to make a good connection. Unfortunately, I cannot apply pressure from the inside of the o-ring section, so it's sealed, but it's a very ugly seal. And I'm not very good at this sealing technique, so it's going to be quite ugly. I then place it in the oven to cool down slowly. I didn't trust that the seal would hold if any racking force was put on it, so I ended up adding some epoxy to the glass. This doesn't help seal it as the glass is already sealed hermetically, but it does help with the structural integrity. This allows the epoxy to hold the weight and not the glass seal itself. Okay, after everything is cool and the epoxy is dry, we can now assemble the reactor. We have the main body of the reactor, a thermometer, a gas inlet, and a reflux condenser. The main reactor has a UV bulb inside of it. This will supply the light needed for the reaction. An interesting thing that you can see with the mercury bulbs is it's made out of quartz glass, but quartz glass won't bind to borosilicate because they have different thermal expansions. It's like trying to bind glass to metal. The glass will just break due to the different expansion difference when cooling. To get around this problem, there is a transitionary material in between that has a thermal expansion closer to that of borosilicate glass and closer to that of quartz. Another cool thing you can see with this bulb is that for the electrodes, it uses uranium glass for its expansion coefficient matching material. Another difference this time, as well as changing the reactor, I'm going to use some Teflon tubing to insert the gas. The Teflon won't react with the Tylene or benzyl chloride in any way. Next, I filled the reactor with Tylene, started the condenser, stirring and heating. Once the Tylene started boiling, I started gas generation for the chlorine. I used a simple gas generator consisting of hydrochloric acid in a dropping funnel and stabilized pool chlorine in the lower flask. Once the hydrochloric acid drips onto the stabilized pool chlorine, chlorine gas is generated. The chlorine gas then started to make its way over and I started a timer and let the reaction run. In the radical chlorination of tylene, UV light initiates the reaction by homolytically cleaving the chlorine molecule into chlorine radicals. These are highly reactive radicals, each with an unpaired electron. One removes the hydrogen atom on the methyl group of tylene, forming a benzyl radical and hydrochloric acid. The benzyl radical is stabilized by the resonance structure of the aromatic ring. Then the benzyl radical reacts with another chlorine molecule to produce benzyl chloride and regenerate a chlorine radical which propagates the chain reaction. This mechanism is characterized by ignition, propagation, and a termination steps. In a perfect world, the ignition and propagation would continue until all the chemicals have reacted. But we still have to continue to add UV light to keep the reaction going due to annoying real world conditions. After about six hours, my chlorine gas generator stopped producing gas, which means the reaction can no longer take place, so I stopped heating and allowed the reactor to cool down to room temperature. At this point, our flask contains benzyl chloride and unreacted tylene. 
Also, during the reaction, it appears that some materials started to polymerize onto the hot discharge tube. This shouldn't really affect anything, but if I don't point it out, someone will. Before wasting time, let's check to make sure we made benzyl chloride. Without doing any analysis, I can tell you that the toluene definitely has chemically transformed, due to the proper increase in temperature and boiling range, but also the fact that I can smell benzyl chloride. It has a very strong smell. Nevertheless, I double checked with NMR and got the proper structures. After cooling the reaction mixture, the next step is to separate unreacted tylene from the benzyl chloride via distillation. Because tylene boils at approximately 110 degrees Celsius and benzyl chloride boils around 170 degrees Celsius, fractional distillation is employed to take advantage of this significant difference. The mixture is then gradually heated and the tylene vaporizes first. It is collected as the initial distillate and can be recycled for future runs. Once all the tylene has been removed, the temperature is increased to collect benzyl chloride as the higher boiling point fraction. After collecting the benzyl chloride fraction, the temperature begins to drop. This means that all our benzyl chloride has moved over to the collection flask and we can stop the distillation heating. Our yield was just over 30 grams of benzyl chloride. Now that we have produced our benzyl chloride and have it separated from the tylene, it's time now to produce benzaldehyde. Now onto benzaldehyde. To begin, I set up a 500 milliliter round bottle flask fitted with a reflux condenser. Inside the flask, I dissolve 24 grams of copper 2 nitrate in 330 milliliters of water. Now copper nitrate isn't normally sold at the hardware store, but you can get calcium nitrate and copper sulfate, which when mixed produce copper nitrate. The copper nitrate solution plays a critical role in facilitating the reaction. Before proceeding any further, I introduce a slow stream of carbon dioxide into the flask. This step is essential because carbon dioxide helps purge any oxygen in the reactor. Oxygen is problematic in this reaction because it could further oxidize our target product, benzaldehyde, into benzoic acid, which we want to avoid. Ensuring an oxygen-free environment increases the yield and purity of the final product. You could also use nitrogen or any other inert gas, but carbon dioxide can be made from chemical decomposition from hardware store chemicals quite easily. Once I was confident that the system was properly flushed with carbon dioxide, I carefully added 30 grams of benzyl chloride, the key starting material which we had synthesized earlier. After adding it, I sealed the reaction vessel with a stopper, then heated the entire setup to boiling and allowed it to run for approximately 8-9 to nine hours. During this time, I observed a slow release of nitrous fumes. These fumes are a normal byproduct of the reaction and indicate the chemical transformation is proceeding as expected. As the reaction proceeded, I noticed that some material was creeping its way towards the top of the reflux condenser, most likely due to the flowing gas carrying material. I had already set the regulator to the lowest liters per minute I could. This creeping will lead to loss of product. So to prevent that, I attached an additional reflux condenser. This will ensure that any vapors will condense and return into the reaction mixture, maximizing efficiency and preventing unwanted losses. After the reaction run had ran for the required time, I allowed everything to cool down before moving on to the extraction process. I knew the reaction had been successful because the horrid order of benzyl chloride was replaced by the sweet one of benzaldehyde. I then transferred the reaction mixture to a separatory funnel and extracted the organics using ether. Ether is an excellent solvent for extracting benzaldehyde because it effectively strips it from the aqueous phase, leaving any copper nitrate solution behind. Ether can be commonly purchased as starting fluid and then purified from that point. After several thorough washes, I remove the ether layer and place it into a beaker on a steam bath, which will gently boil the ether away to eliminate the solvent. Once all the solvent is gone, we are left with a yellowish oil. To further purify the product, I treated the yellow oil with saturated sodium bisulfate solution. You can get sodium bisulfate from stump removers. This step is particularly useful because sodium bisulfite reacts selectively with benzaldehyde to form a solid bisulfide adduct, separating it from soluble impurities. I left the mixture to stir for about 30 minutes, and after stirring for a while, white colorless crystals began to form. These crystals signify the presence of purified benzaldehyde in a bisulfide bound form. Next, I vacuum filtered the crystals in a fritted glass filter to remove any remaining water soluble impurities. I then washed the crystals with small amounts of alcohol and ether. This leaves us with a pure bisulfide adduct.
The next step is to recover benzaldehyde in its unbound form from these crystals. To do this, I added an excess of dilute sulfuric acid around 5 molar. Concentrated sulfuric acid can be purchased as drain cleaner. The acid breaks the bisulfite addict apart, releasing pure benzaldehyde. To further purify the benzaldehyde, I perform steam distillation. We transfer the sulfuric acid and benzaldehyde to the boiling flask and add some excess water to the flask. The typical steam distillation setup is similar to that of simple distillation, with the main difference being the use of a Claisen adapter. This technique is particularly useful because it allows benzaldehyde to distill at a lower temperature than it normally would at its boiling point, reducing the risk of thermal degradation. We then start heating and allow the water to boil. The steam created will carry over any relatively volatile organic materials such as benzaldehyde with it. This both purifies it and separates it from the sulfuric acid, which has a much higher boiling point. After collecting the distillate, I extracted it once more with ether. Benzaldehyde is only slightly soluble in water, but much more soluble in ether, so the ether strips it out of solution. I then separated it from the ether from the aqueous layer. The ether is then dried over calcium chloride, commonly sold as low temp deicer, to remove any moisture that might be remaining. Finally, I carefully decanted the dried ether solution and removed the ether by boiling on a steam bath, leaving behind a purified benzaldehyde, which I confirmed via NMR analysis. Both benzyl chloride and benzaldehyde are very useful chemicals in organic synthesis. We can go from a relatively inert chemical like tylene into a reactive precursor used for many reactions. In the next video, we'll take benzaldehyde and couple it together to form a product which we'll use in various biphenyl compounds, such as one to treat seizures and the other one to treat allergies, both starting as paint thinner. This means we're on to our next project, and thanks for watching.